are delighted to welcome back Dr. Ross Hanfler of the Sociology Department of the College, who's going to talk about kids and deviance. <laughs> Which, I mean, I never heard as many gasps out of this group as I did last week. So I think you got us hooked. A couple of announcements before Russ gets going. One is that after, well, two weeks from today, Karen Edwards, who's the Assistant Dean and Director of International Student Affairs, will be here to talk about becoming international students friendly. And that's a one-time session. You can register now, and there's no charge for that one. Okay? Then the usual announcements, although I'm going to add a little something. Yeah, just a little added interest. So if you're using your T-cell, turn that on now. Turn off or mute your phone if you haven't done that. And what's the third one? You're going to pass the mic around. And <laughs> That's right. And now I'm going to demonstrate how you need to use the mic. <laughs> so that I don't have to do that to you when I'm out there. Because you'll already know. I'm going to do it in profile. <laughs> yeah, and it has to be right up almost on your mouth. I mean, it has to be in your personal space. <laughs> See? So it doesn't work out here. It doesn't work down here. It has to be like this. <laughs> How am I doing? Can everybody hear me? All right. Good signals from the back. Thank you so much for having me back again. I didn't scare too many of you away last time. That's good. <laughs> I really appreciate being invited. Again, this is a real gift to get to share with you some of the things that I spend my time studying. I'm a pretty lucky guy to get to do the sort of things that I get to do. Well, I thought I'd start off telling you again a little bit about my background, and you'll see where this is going. I was a child of the 1980s. And if you were really pay paying attention in the 1980s, it was a dangerous time for young people. This is when the fantasy role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons gained in popularity. Oh, I'm seeing some nods already. Fantastic. This is a game where players gather around a table and a dungeon master, kind of the leader, creates this story in everyone's imagination and everyone takes on the role of different characters who are solving puzzles, fighting battles. Think kind of Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, but you're writing the story collectively. So I got into Dungeons and Dragons, as many of my peers did in the 80s. And it wasn't long before we started hearing things in the news about how Dungeons and Dragons was encouraging kids to worship Satan, practice witchcraft, and do all these kinds of occult activities. I thought, wow, I really chose an intense game here. <laughs> Well, on top of Dungeons and Dragons, there was a genre of music that was gaining in popularity called heavy metal. And specifically, there was a genre called thrash metal that was sometimes dabbling in, into issues of the occult. And so one of my favorite bands at the time, don't judge, was called Slayer. And Slayer had these images of demons and hellfire and all these kinds of things. And again, I have these awkward kind of conversations with my mother about my record collection as she was seeing in the news that listening to bands like Slayer and Black Sabbath and all these other kinds of heavy metal music were going to encourage me to either take, take my own life or worship the devil. Awkward conversations. <laughs> well, that wasn't the only genre of music that was gaining popularity in the 80s. Of course, rap music, which had really gotten its legs in the late 70s, was becoming increasingly popular, and a certain genre of rap music also was really growing in the late, in the late 80s called gangster rap. This is the group NWA from uh, Compton, and 
They started singing about their experience of life on the, uh, in, in their neighborhoods, and their experience was often filled with drugs, violence, sex, and so on. And so again, we got this message that listening to rap music was going to encourage young people to be overly sexual, to do drugs, and most importantly, to perpetrate violence. Because some of these lyrics were explicitly violent, and I would agree, glorify violence in a certain kind of a way. All right? And then on top of that, <laughs> video games weren't any longer just confined to the arcade at the mall. They were coming into our homes. And so my younger brother and I were thrilled one Christmas when my, my grandmother and my aunt pooled their money and bought us the Atari 2600. This was one of the early mass-marketed game systems for the home. It looked like this, and we would gather around and play and just have all kinds of fun blowing one another up in little boxy tanks. But again, there was some worry on the part of adults and parents and authorities that, oh my goodness, now video games are going to somehow be corrupting our youth, and again, might be glorifying violence, or even if not that, they're just a complete waste of time. A complete waste of time. So it's a miracle that any kids survived the 1980s, but somehow we did. And the funny thing is now, of course, each of these examples is fairly mainstream. So if you look at Dungeons and Dragons, now it's almost celebrated as a key part of some of our most popular entertainers' creativity. People like Stephen Colbert need to actually brag about their playing Dungeons and Dragons. And it's very much acknowledged at this point as something that is a creative enterprise that brings kids together. In fact, my 10-year-old, whose birthday was just this weekend, insisted that we play Dungeons and Dragons with her friends. And I texted one of my friends, oh, we're going to play D&D. &D. It's a bunch of 10-year-olds. And he immediately texted back, great, I see the headlines now. Ross Hempler introduces witchcraft to Grinnell Island. <laughs> But it's fairly celebrated at this point. Oops. Um, video games are also ubiquitous. Now, there are still worries about video games, and we'll come back to that, so hang on to your thoughts about that. But again, this is another realm of creativity. Rap music, um, NWA that I put up there, Ice Cube. One of those musicians now stars in children's movies. <laughs> Ice T, who was one of the big gangster rappers at the time, he's the star of one of the... Uh, Law and Order shows that maybe some of you have watched, SBU. Yes. Totally mainstream at this point. Metallica, which was a heavy metal band that came to my town, or Rapid City, in the, in the late 80s. When they were coming to town, the local pastors and the local authorities tried to get them banned from coming because they were worried they would corrupt us. Metallica is like the biggest band in the world now. They've won Grammy Awards. In every single one of these cases, as we, re we reflect back on the threat, we realize that maybe the threat wasn't such a big deal. Quick review of last time. Remember we talked about this deviance being socially constructed rather than absolute. That we experience deviance through a set of filters that we're taught. We learn what is deviant, and what is deviant changes over time. Remember we talked a little bit about that human beings are meaning makers and that people don't actually become quote-unquote deviant until someone labels them so. And most important to segue into today is that we talked about that who and what gets labeled deviant depends a lot on social power. So the same people can be doing the same, different people can be doing the same kinds of things. Remember the saints and the roughnecks? but they can be judged very differently based on their race or social class and so on. So today I want to think a little bit more about this notion of youth as a problem. And don't get me wrong, I'm not going to argue that there aren't things about young people that we might worry about. I'm not going to suggest that we shouldn't care at all about the music that our kids listen to or the pop culture they, they consume. That's not it at all. However, I will be arguing that a lot of times some of our fears about youth are misplaced and that in some cases we're actually fearing, quote unquote, the wrong things. One of the reasons that youth become a, a problem is that they're easy targets. If they're not 18, they can't vote. 
even if they aren't 18, a lot of times they don't vote. <laughs> they don't have a lot of recourse to push back against adults labeling them. Youth are fairly easy targets for these kinds of things. To illustrate these points, we're going to walk through this concept, I think it's a really fun concept, called moral panic. So stay tuned. This notion that people get really worked up based around a threat that they perceive. And finally, we'll end up uh, later on after our break and some questions wondering whether we fear the right things. Let me just ask you quickly, and again, thank you for the good tutorial, Janet, about the microphone. What are some things that you recall throughout your lifetime, people really being worried about youth, whether it was the 60s or the 70s, some of you have probably had kids that were growing up in the 70s and the 80s. Can you think of any other examples of things where that was something adults were worried about? Looks like we have George Way in the back. In the uh, 50s, or it might have been the late 40s, mm -hmm. they had a Senate hearing, and the senator, I believe, was Kefauver, and they were worried about comic books. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> and I learned to read by reading comic books, but my mother was concerned. And then several years later, she said, you know, Dave, I threw away that Superman comic book, and I read now that it was really the first. <laughs> and the big bucks. And look how you turned out to be, right? <laughs> comic books completely corrupted you. <laughs> Any other examples of things that. We've got a couple more in here. Uh, I'm Gail Strickler. Uh, long hair. Mm. Oh. <laughs> I went through my own long hair phase, and uh, that definitely was a signal to some of the adults in my life that I was headed down the wrong path. <laughs> yes? Sorry for blocking. When I was, I'm Dorothy Knorr, when I was 15, 16 years old, youth group activities were important to me. And I had to go before the church council because I wanted a 45 record player in the church so we could dance. Oh my goodness. <laughs> this I was is... given permission, but I had to go ask. Right. <laughs> Again, we can all imagine kind of the concerns that might have been coming up. This is like a real life Footloose um, moment. Footloose <laughs> was a film about a small town where the religious folk are really worried about dancing. They don't allow music and dancing. Right. One more. I was Nan Swan, and my father was worried about Ricky Nelson and Elvis Presley. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm sure we could think of some more. <laughs> and there he is. So, I want, what I want to point out here with these particular slides is that what we're going to discuss is not something new. And this is what I think makes it a really interesting and powerful sociological theory. That we can come up with a, a social pattern that persists over time, a process that persists over time. So yes, Elvis Presley, when he was on, was it the Ed Sullivan show, I believe? They initially only would show him from the waist up, because we all know how Elvis danced. Elvis the pelvis, right? I'm not going to demonstrate. That will embarrass us all. <laughs> but again, there were these worries that Elvis and his particular style of dancing was evocative of some kind of wanton sexuality, that if our kids perceived it, they may be sexually active in ways that they might not want. Similar things happened with the Beatles and the so-called Beatlemania. So the Beatles come to the U.S. and the young girls go bananas, screaming and carrying on, fainting, all these sorts of things. And again, there are these worries that, oh my goodness, this new rock music is going to have some kind of negative effect on young people. This is what we call in sociology a moral panic. And a moral panic is when a significant number of people believe that a group of evildoers, or whatever language you want to put in there, pose a threat to the moral order and therefore must 
be stopped. And key to this is this, this evaluation that the real danger, the real danger exceeds the perceived threat. In other words, there's a disconnect, a disproportionate um, belief going on here. Okay? And there's, a, there's some subjective, sub, some sub, subjectivity, sorry to that, uh, that we can come back to. So what I'm going to do is walk you through some different stages of a moral panic. And it's gonna, it's a, it feels a little linear, but these things will very much overlap. And we'll do a number of examples as we go. Because my mission today is to, to really equip you to notice moral panics as they come up today and in the future. Because I guarantee you they will. The first stage of a moral panic is that someone defines something as a threat. This is Tipper Gore, and I'm honestly not sure who that person is, I don't know if anybody remembers, but Tipper Gore was the um, wife of then-Senator Al Gore, future Vice President Al Gore, and I've got to say that Tipper Gore was kind of my nemesis when I was a teenager. <laughs> because I was into this heavy music, it's just what spoke to me at the time, I was really into this heavy music. Tipper Gore headed an organization called the PMRC, the Parent Music Resource Center. And what she did, as the wife of a senator with influence, she got a bunch of other Washington uh, wives together, and they decided that they would target music as being corrupting of youth, and that they would put out this literature and encourage their husbands in the Senate at the time to hold congressional hearings to discuss the negative aspects of popular music. They famously came up with the Filthy 15, which was a list of notorious music that they even categorized for the detrimental, based upon the detrimental effects they thought it would have on you. So I know this is hard to read, but an X over there means that it's profane or sexually explicit. We got a lot of that. It is rock and roll, after all. O means occult. So there was a band called Venom uh, in the early 80s that, that used a lot of satanic imagery. D-A is drugs or alcohol, so we've got a little bit of that. And V is violent. Now, again, it's not just heavy metal that was caught up in this. One of my first records was Prince's Purple Rain record. It had a very explicit song on it called Darling Nikki about a woman masturbating with a magazine, a very you know, of con you know, very in people's faces at the time. But Sheena Easton was also just a pop musician. Def Leppard was kind of a pop metal band from uh, the UK. Madonna, I think some of us, many of us will have some idea what goes on to become, you know, a pop culture icon. Um, Cindy Lauper, you know, Sheep Bop. I mean, you were hearing these, some of these songs on the radio. But this is their target. So, these... These folks saw a problem, they defined the threat, and the media picked up on it. So let's come back to Dungeons and Dragons for just a moment, um, because this is so fresh in my mind after corrupting 10-year-olds this year. <laughs> the media picks up on a number of stories about the, the potential negative consequences of Dungeons and Dragons. And what happens at this stage of a moral panic is typically the danger is somehow exaggerated, the facts are somehow distorted, and especially, there's a prediction that the problem will escalate without intervention. I don't know if any of you are Oprah Winfrey fans, and I, I have no feelings about Oprah one way or another, but those kinds of shows, along with Geraldo Rivera, etc., they would do these episodes about whatever problem was, and it was always something like, do you know that your kids are doing this? And a growing threat. <laughs> If this is not stopped, it, whether it was road rage or workers, quote unquote, going postal, all of these things may have had some kind of grain of truth to them. But in this process through the media, they typically get exaggerated. So you can see here, a teenager was convicted of gunning down his foster father, blames the game Dungeons and Dragons. A couple use fantasy game to lure sex victim. These are the kinds of headlines that are going on around Dungeons and Dragons. Books are being written, the devil's web. Who is stalking your children for Satan? 
was all about Dungeons and Dragons. Definition up here in one of these, these pamphlets that were circulating at the time. Dungeons and Dragons. A fantasy role-playing game which uses demonology, witchcraft, voodoo, murder, rape, blasphemy, suicide, etc., etc. I mean, look at this list. <laughs> like, that's a lot to hang on a game that's being sold in malls. <laughs> so the media gets a hold of it, it amplifies the danger, exaggerates a little bit, and we get caught in kind of a, what, what, what Stuart Hall called a signification spiral. It becomes this easily recognizable threat. A gamer. Well, as this happens, then public awareness is growing, concern is growing. Um, like I said, my, my hometown tried to ban Metallica from playing, it was very amusing. And then we even have things like, and I'm sure some of you will remember this, the, um, the daycare sex abuse scandals of the 80s. So you had some high-profile cases where couples that ran daycares were charged, and there was this story going around that kids were being abused and used in satanic rituals in daycares, and more parents would come out of the woodwork, more kids were coming out and making these claims, um, and of course the headlines are coming out. Now this is fascinating because at this stage, Sometimes adults who had no clue about what was going on see this and then think, oh, I didn't know this, but now I better start worrying about it and thinking about it. Let me figure out if this is going on. So you're simply becoming aware that there's a problem at all. And then it takes on kind of a life of its own. Well, of course, as this problem is growing, being magnified, well, then authorities eventually find themselves in a position of having to make some kind of a response. So here I've put up, this is a famous case maybe about, maybe not quite 10 years ago, where in Indonesia um, there were a group of punk kids who weren't really anti-religious um, for the most part, um, but were dressing in the whole punk rock attire that we looked at last time, the spiked leather jackets, they're listening to the punk rock music, and some of the religious authorities in the Aceh province of Indonesia, um, which is a province that, unlike some of the other provinces, practices Sharia uh, law a little more closely, they got a wind of this and they gathered up these punks and forced them into re-education camps, shaved their heads, and tried to deprogram them from punk. This kind of thing also happened in the U.S., especially in the 80s. There were little parent support groups and little um, experts that would come along that would say, hey, we can help you get your kid out of punk rock, as if punk rock was some kind of a, a cult. Okay? Authorities issue some kind of response. The congressional hearings we mentioned, that's a big one. There have been congressional hearings about rap music even after the PMRC, uh, not so long ago. I mean, think about this for a second. All the problems in the world and Congress people are taking some time to really dig into what are the impacts of rap music. <laughs> the final kind of a stage that I'll mention uh, for the time being is that, well, okay, authorities get involved, they have to maybe make some policies. And so you see some kinds of policies coming up, including what we pejoratively called, we kids in the 80s, the tipper sticker. Remember, Tipper, Tipper Gore is my nemesis. <laughs> so she gets these folks together, the senators start raising a stink, the music industry says, okay, fine, we will put these stickers on our CDs, our records at the time, and you can still see these once in a while, right? And in fact, um, stores like Walmart will just refuse to carry certain music that they are worried that will offend parts of their buying public. And so the, the funny response from some musicians is they actually make two records. One has all the cursing and <laughs> everything on it, and the other is like, the, I don't know, the bleeped out version or the re rewritten version so they can sell it at places like Walmart. So this is the tipper sticker, parent advisory, uh, warning, explicit content. And again, I'm not suggesting that this is a terrible idea. I'm a parent. <laughs> I may want some kind of a clue into what I'm purchasing for my kids, what my kids are listening to. So don't think I'm totally dismissing this, but what I will question is, is 
well, why are we focusing on this issue in particular? We do the same things with video games, um, and I'm sure we can have some time in a bit to talk about video games, because we are in the midst of a moral panic, a long moral panic about video games. And so we also have rating system for video games, rating for all kinds of different content. And again, I think there's some utility here, um, but we always have to ask who's doing the labeling and what interests are they serving. We have uh, moral panics about things like bathroom bills. So as trans folk assert their greater rights, that doesn't sit well with with everyone, and you have a policy change, and we have this whole construction about trans people as threats, uh, in, in particular to our youth, and in particular to young girls, are sort of used as a prop that they are threatened somehow. And one of the policies that results is that some states try to pass these so called bathroom bills. So that's one sort of outcome of a moral panic. But what happens with all of these things, virtually without fail, is that they eventually recede. <laughs> they eventually go away. So I gave you some examples from the get-go um, about how these bands are now these act they're, they're actors in popular shows. A few more examples. The Sex Pistols, which were the notorious UK punk band in 1976 and 77, that they had this record called God Save the Queen. And the lyrics were, God save the queen, she ain't no human being. And all about how she's a fascist and all these things. It's a, it's a, it's a work of political critique. <laughs> well, you can <could> imagine. <laughs> you can imagine the backlash to the sex pistols. Fast forward to the London Olympics, 2010? recently, <laughs> and the Sex Pistols and punk rock music are featured in part of the opening ceremony. <laughs> and they've got these like figures pogoing around like punks. The Sex Pistols are part of the UK's cultural heritage at this point, an accepted part of that heritage. They were at one point a significant, significant threat. Another example might be Ozzy Osbourne, who was the singer for Black Sabbath, one of the original U.S. Uh, heavy metal bands. Again, very much singing about the occult, but also anti-war songs. They had a famous song called War Pigs. Well, they were accused of, or, or Ozzy Osbourne was accused of promoting suicide. There were lawsuits. He had a song called Suicide Solution. This song was about his struggle with alcoholism and drug addiction. And the whole thing was sort of uh, against drug and alcohol abuse. In other words, that he was seeing himself slowly kill himself through these things. But again, imagine the perception of some suicide solution. That's terrifying. Lawsuits. Fast forward <laughs> 20 years, Ozzy Osbourne is the, is the star of a popular reality television show about his family called the Osbourne. He's sort of this bumbling guy that you can't really understand. <laughs> and he's made an object of fun. That's how these things change. They eventually recede. Slayer, that record I put up, Show No Mercy at the beginning, the one that I had uncomfortable conversations about with, about, uh, with my mother about, had a record called South of Heaven. Again, very provocative. Tom Morea, singer of Slayer, they are also winning. Now. This is the band that was going to turn us all into Satanists. Let me add just a couple of things before we take a break. The notion of a moral panic isn't quite satisfying because of the word panic. I don't know what comes to mind when you think panic, but I, I sort of think of, well, something spontaneously erupts, catches on, and people kind of lose their minds, and it's out of control and uncontrollable. It's a panic. That's not precisely what's going on here. What's really going on is what we might better call a moral entrepreneurial campaign. Let me tell you just a little bit about what I mean. What we see is there are actually people taking deliberate action and profiting off of labeling these different things deviant. 
You see the distinction I'm making here? It's not necessarily a panic that just swells up from the grassroots. Like somehow somebody sees some Satanist graffiti and that spreads and suddenly there's a panic. What I'm suggesting is that there are actually people, often people with some degree of power or influence, that are using their influence to create the problem. To actually create the problem. Actively. So what's happened, what happens is, is that these moral entrepreneurs, they actively raise awareness of the problem. And they go about systematically trying to convert people to their point of view so that they can create and enforce new rules. So let's pick up on comic books. <laughs> comic books, very scary for a while there. Again, we had commissions. This was also wrapped up in McCarthyism and other sorts of things. And there were pamphlets that would go around the truth about comic books. And I blew up the, the little piece down here for you. Do you have the courage to learn the truth about comic books? Are you willing to face the facts and act accordingly? Crime, sex, love, murder. We had books like The Seduction of the Innocent. Again, based on especially this comic company called EC Comics, that, you know, for the 40s, 50s, and the 60s, very um, provocative. My point here is that there were people that saw this as a threat and made it their mission to make it a social problem. It didn't just sort of happen. You might have been just pleasantly reading your comic book, <laughs> and mom and dad are really unaware that there's a problem, but then somebody comes along and say, says, hey, you better check out your kid's comic book. And so once again, we get a label, a warning system for parents. This is kind of a, a fun one. There was a whole scare with heavy metal around back masking. I want to show you just a brief clip here. Back masking is when you play a record backwards. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Again, not only rock music, but people in Hollywood, all over who are being called by Satan into his army. Okay, <laughs> Oprah Winfrey said she was lonely and out of it until she came in contact with the, the universal hum. Okay, you see it over and over and over and over again. And I tell you right now, people in high places are being used by spirits to suck the world into the new age <laughs> under Antichrist. And it's not just in rock music. That just happens to be what we're exposing today. In fact, your head is humming, and it won't go in case you don't know. The piper's calling you to join him. Dear lady, can you hear the wind blow? The lady that started off the tune. The lady that thought all that glitters was gold. Dear lady, can you... What he's doing is he's deconstructing one of the most popular songs in all of music history, Western music history, called Stairway to Heaven by a band called Led Zeppelin. You know, it's got this really soft acoustic beginning, and then it builds to this rocking crescendo. So he's got the lyrics up. And he's explaining this song. Hear the wind blow, and did you know your stairway lies on the whispering wind? Where's the whispering wind? Remember we talked about that? Remember that was the piper's past. And it's whispered that soon if we all call the tune, then the piper will lead us to reason. So he's basically telling this woman that she is going to hell. Your stairway lies on the whispering wind. Where does your stairway lie? <laughs> So, if I said to uh, somebody, hey, your stairway lies in the whispering wind, I'd basically be telling them that they're going to hell, because the whispering wind was the piper's path, as we've already sung. Now, before we go to the, the lyrics backwards and look at stairway to heaven backwards, which I think we should, I want to show you something in a bootleg by Led Zeppelin, where they actually changed the words to this song. I think we'll skip right they to the back. That was <laughs> Listen to what you hear backwards. <laughs> First, we'll hear a little bit forward. Listen carefully. Raise your hand if you heard anything right away. Okay, that was without me even telling you anything. I've seen a lot of hands go up. Forward. Your stairway lies on the whispering wind. Forward it says, and your stairway lies on the whispering wind. Backwards it says, because I live with Satan. Listen carefully. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Raise your hands if you heard that. <laughs> quite clear, quite obvious. There's a lot more. Your stairway lies in the whispering wind. Dear lady, just 
just like the Led Zeppelin. <laughs> <laughs> So the notion of subliminal messages or secret codes or something embedded in our pop culture, is, it, it, it was really, really caught on. So this gentleman here is what we would call a moral entrepreneur. In other words, he's seen an opportunity, think the word entrepreneur, we usually associate that with business, right? And I don't know if he's getting paid for this or not. Um, but there are other shots in that clip that pan over the crowd, and there's this group of people, and they're all nodding. And this may be, in 2019, sort of easy to dismiss as a bit silly, but I'll suggest to you as a sociologist that we're all susceptible to this at different points in time, okay? So, you know, feel free to giggle, I know I do, but part of what we're up to today is, I think, inoculating ourselves a bit to whatever comes next. There will be something, okay? So, Led Zeppelin, that we'll come back to in just a minute. One more point, and then I think, yeah, we're pretty close to a break, is that in these moral panics, these moral entrepreneurial campaigns, they often rely on experts. They'll bring some kind of expert to bear to try to convince people of their case. So in this case, we see, I, I don't know what this person's credentials are, but he's got some kind of, a, of authority that these people have come out and they pay attention to what he's saying. And so experts are either, they're sometimes academics, <laughs> they're sometimes lawyers, they're sometimes religious folk, but they have some kind of credential that gives them some kind of expertise that people rely upon in order to get their information. But when you dig into these things a little bit, what we find over and over again is that their credentials are typically very dubious. <laughs> the data on which they base their conclusions is very sketchy. And that sometimes they have no credentials at all. So think back to some of the examples that we've given. <coughs> Heavy metal, comic books, even the terrifying daycare panics. At some point, sociologists and others really dig in. Like they really dig in and try to find evidence. There's almost none for any, any evidence uh, for any of those things having the kinds of impacts that they, they were once purported to have. And in fact, in the case of heavy metal that caused me so much grief, and Tipper Gore <laughs> causing me so much grief as a teen, some of the research on kids that listen to heavy metal actually proves the exact opposite of what its critics were proposing. In other words, that some kids come to heavy metal because they are ostracized at school, they're dealing with depression or other kinds of things in their lives, and they actually find a lot of solace in this music, a lot of support, that it actually makes them feel better <laughs> rather than Let's take a break, and when we come back, we'll watch just a 10-minute clip that I, I can't do, I can't explain it any better than this clip will, about how these panics intersect with drugs. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions today. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. And if you'll come back a little before 10 up by that clock, or listen for the bell. Are we all set? Okay. We're going to watch a 10-minute clip from the New York Times Retro Report. I highly recommend these. There's one on Dungeons and Dragons that you can ch check out at your leisure. But this is about crack babies. So this is another case from the, the 80s in particular, where there was this notion that there was going to be a whole generation of babies that were born addicted to crack, and that was going to have uh, consequences for generations to come. So take just a minute, and as you watch, think about those different aspects of moral panic, how the media plays a role, moral entrepreneurs, experts, and the notion of how this spreads. There's one Learning about cocaine today, crack now has spread to almost every American city. It is a problem in Houston, Philadelphia, Kansas City, Tucson, and Sacramento. In the 1980s, 
the media sounded the alarm that a new drug, crack cocaine, was taking over American cities and that it had an especially devastating effect on pregnant women and their newborns. A new study says that babies born to women who use cocaine during pregnancy are three times as likely to be born with birth defects. They tend to be what we call jittery. They're very, very high risk for cerebral palsy, mental retardation. They are prone to hypertension, strokes, and sudden infant death syndrome. These children, who are the most expensive babies ever born in America, are going to overwhelm every social service delivery system that they come in contact with throughout the rest of their lives. Drugs take away the dream from every child's heart and replace it with a nightmare. But were these infants really doomed? Nearly three decades later, what is the true legacy of the crack baby era? In the early 1980s, Dr. Ira Chasnoff, a young researcher at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in Chicago, decided to study what he saw as a worrisome trend among his pregnant patients who had used cocaine. Women were coming in and their babies were looking different when they were born. They had higher rates of prematurity and they had higher rates of newborn seizures and other complications. A lot of the babies exposed to cocaine are quite small. We think that's related to the use of the drug during pregnancy. We'd seen effects of alcohol and other substances on children, so we were certainly open to the idea that this was a, a problem. Cocaine was epidemic. I think that it was um, something that the media, I mean, it became an exciting thing to talk about. What you got? What you got? We call our broadcast 48 Hours on Crack Street. You call us a state of crack house? Yeah, and then this was soon after our paper was published within days we were getting calls from media all over the country uh and started hearing the term crack babies spotlight tonight our investigative series on cocaine kids despite all the warnings a growing number of babies are being born already addicted to cocaine as it got out into the world it became this this phenomenon 23 babies were born to the cocaine using women in this study because the problem has appeared so suddenly there are few reliable statistics. The number of so-called cocaine babies is growing at an astonishing rate. The number of babies born addicted has risen more than 500%. I had lots of people interviewing me. Dr. Ira Chasnoff of Chicago's Northwestern Memorial Hospital runs the oldest program researching cocaine and the newborn. It appears that cocaine has uh, just as devastating effect on pregnancy and the newborn as heroin. Chasnoff told reporters that cocaine exposure was causing some babies to be born with brain damage and that others were overwhelmed by even simple eye contact with the mother. These children are not normal in the sense that they're going to be able to enter the classic school uh, schoolroom and function in large groups of children. Other researchers and doctors echoed Chasnoff's conclusions and a host of seemingly recognizable symptoms took hold. One of the things that we see about babies who have been exposed to cocaine is they tend to be very tremulous and shaky, very fine kinds of tremors. We looked to see if we would find the effects that were reported, and we were saying, well, we're not seeing this. As Chasnoff's star rose, Dr. Claire Coles was reaching a different, though equally startling, conclusion about crack babies based on her study of infant behavior at Emory University. The effects didn't seem consistent with the action of the drug itself. Many of the children who were the so-called classic cocaine babies were premature babies. And the symptoms that were seen on the videos, on television, the you know, tremoring arms and all that, that was prematurity. You could have taken any premature baby and gotten the same image. I think that people got very focused on cocaine is the cause of this rather than thinking substance abuse is the cause of this, maternal lifestyle is the cause of this, social issues are the cause of this. But Coles' findings didn't fit within the narrative of what had become a national scare. Cocaine. Crack. If you use drugs while you're pregnant, your baby can die. There's a whole lot of people who feel that if you can just scare people sufficiently about something, um, that that's better than actually telling them the truth about something because that'll prevent them from doing bad things. <laughs> 
agenda tonight poses this question. What would you do about pregnant women who use drugs and pass those drugs on to their babies? By the late 1980s, Chasnoff's findings were being used to justify cases charging pregnant cocaine users as child abusers, drug dealers, and killers. I was at first stunned and then angry that they would distort the information. That's when I started realizing how a lot of this can be taken out of context and used to bolster any kind of argument. People may have felt that they were doing the right thing, but I mean the idea that one would prosecute a pregnant woman and use this kind of not very accurate research to do so is very disturbing. As the prosecutions continued, crack babies grew to toddlers. No one knows how many there are, or even how best to identify them. But educators suspect that tens of thousands of crack kids are in kindergartens in inner cities, in suburbia, even in small town America. It now threatens to create an entirely new underclass of children unable to care for themselves, of infants born to suffer. In the United States this year, at least 100,000 crack babies will be born. Today, the government said it will cost $5 billion a year to care for such babies, and money doesn't begin to tell the whole story. I'm supposed to be a victim of that crack era. I was supposed to be disruptive, mentally unstable. I wasn't supposed to reach the point where I am now. The initial hypothesis is that drug abuse would lead to huge physical deformities, huge mental deformities in, in children. And, you know, in myself, I didn't see any of those things. So it would be easy for me to believe that that science doesn't hold true. Almost three decades since Chasnoff's initial research, which focused on just 23 babies, Long-term studies have found only subtle changes in the brains of cocaine-exposed research subjects like Stone. There's no particular evidence of this social-emotional deficit. You're not seeing really broad-scale, severe developmental problems, as was predicted. The schools have not been overwhelmed by the flood of cocaine-exposed children. In fact, Stone became the first in her family to graduate from college. In learning that I had been exposed, I kind of told myself I'm not going to make this an issue. Whatever I have to do to get around what the effects may be, I'll do that. The paper was a very preliminary kind of finding, and it really shouldn't have been generalized to the extent it was, which I believe that Dr. Chasnoff eventually came to himself and said that he felt that, that, that this didn't really represent the whole of the situation. Doctor, let's go to you on this question. You've studied this, perhaps one of the first people to study this. How does cocaine use affect newborns? Well, there's no question that cocaine use during pregnancy has some real effects on the unborn and on the newborn child. Uh, but these effects are not devastating and can be addressed through treatment for the pregnant woman and for the child. Over time, Chasnov did distance himself from some of the extreme pronouncements he was quoted as making in the early days. I probably talked too much or gave long-winded explanations which were completely cut out. It was one of those feelings where you just feel completely out of control. But the hysteria that followed his initial research had already taken its toll. It wasn't even a natural disaster or war. It was a drug that caused so much harm among my generation and my parents' generation. Certainly cocaine was contributing to this problem, but they got very focused on it as the only sole cause of it. I think people still believe the cocaine story, but alcohol is much more of a problem than cocaine because there's much more alcohol abused and it has much more severe effects. I think if you say something three times out loud, people take it as fact. And also, I think there's certain ideas that people want to believe that really fit in with cultural stereotypes, and it's hard to get rid of those. I couldn't explain it, I don't think much better than 
than that. You have your experts, you have the media saying that this is a growing threat. Did you notice that? It's a growing threat. You have shaky evidence, and you have it taking on, as the doctor put it, kind of a life of its own. Let me just make a few more points here with some examples, and then we'll have, I hope, plenty of time for questions, because I know, given the break, that a lot of you have some things you want to wrestle with a little bit. So one of the questions that comes up is, well, why? How do we explain these things? If moral panics seem to be a social phenomenon that occurs across different generations and time periods, and I will argue we will see more in the future, what's going on here? So let me offer just a few explanations. Well, one explanation is that there's some scapegoating going on here. Um, that in focusing on certain kinds of problems, we can blame people for those problems and therefore avoid thinking about what's really at the root of some of these problems. I really think the crack, the crack baby example is pertinent here because you can blame the mothers, and in fact you can prosecute them, right? Rather than thinking about, well, what else is it about maternal health that we're not doing well as a society? You see what I'm arguing? I'll come back to that. But there are many things that impact uh, prenatal health, um, baby's health, mother's health. But this allows for a nice caricature. These bad moms, they're the ones that are to blame. And I'm not suggesting that they're blameless, blameless, and I certainly wouldn't argue that anybody should use crack cocaine. I'm just saying that there's a bit of scapegoating potentially going on there. A second explanation might be about surveillance and suppression. So remember that last time when we talked about defining deviance, we really focused in on social power. That there's an advantage to people in power being able to apply deviant labels. Well, what comes out of the crack baby scare? Remember last time as well, I put up the sentencing disparities for crack versus powdered cocaine, and I said that until relatively recently, the sentencing guidelines for crack were 100 times greater than for powdered cocaine. That comes out of some of that, those images that we saw of these tragic images of babies that were plastered all over the media and took hold. So this gives, then, law enforcement sort of a, a legitimate excuse to police, quote-unquote, dangerous groups anyway. And we see this over and over again with drug law enforcement. So if you want to go way back, you can make an argument that part of the temperance movement was controlling the unruly Irish. You could go back a little further and think about all the laws passed against opium dens designed to control Chinese immigrant labor that were working on railroads. So we're getting a little few too many Chinese people. Let's make sure that we have a way to monitor them and surveil them. You could think about the ecstasy scares of the 90s that I mentioned last time, these dance parties, electronic dance music and ecstasy. And you could think about even the drinking age, if you really wanted to be critical, as ways to surveil and police youth in particular ways. Okay. So all these things give an extra reason to be able to surveil and suppress certain groups. Which leads into the next point. If you can do that, you can reg regulate undesirable behavior, and you can regulate those groups. So you incarcerate, essentially, two generations of black and brown men coming out and part of this, this crack baby scare. And you notice that the one doctor she from, from Emory, she mentions that her theory of why this caught on is that it fed into, how did she put it, cultural stereotypes or something like that. It was ready-made, it was ready, it was just packaged so well to fit, frankly, a, a white supremacist kind of mindset. And we're all susceptible to that. I'm not pointing any fingers. That's a culture that we live in that already stigmatizes black and brown people. And so when this comes along, it's like, look at these women of color who are irresponsible and harming babies. It just clicks. It's like, well, of course, that fits. They're an undesirable group. Of course, then, if you enact policies, you can reinforce social hierarchy. It's very handy, whether it's by age or race or class or whatever. Um, 
There was this old show called Cops. Anyone ever see this show, Cops? It was a reality TV show, and it would follow police officers around on their beat, and you know, the camera crew would be right behind them, and the cops. And inevitably, and I've watched a number of episodes, inevitably what happens in the episode is that some poor white person or poor person of color is running away down a sidewalk. Usually it's a male. Half the time he's got his shirt off. And the cops run after him, and they tackle him and chase him and get him down, and they get their man, right? <laughs> that kind of imagery reinforces that, oh yeah, these are the kinds of people that commit crimes. You'll never see a show called White Collar Crime, <laughs> you know, in which, like, the, the, <laughs> the body-armored law enforcement go down to Wall Street and kick open the door and <laughs> run in. That's not going to happen. That's an issue of social power. <laughs> and most importantly here, what happens is, is that we get a form of symbolic politics happening. If you're a politician until relatively recently, and actually still today, being tough on drugs is just an easy, easy thing to, to, to portray yourself on the stump. You know, tough on crime, tough on drugs. And even if you're someone holding congressional hearings about rap music or heavy metal, you are able to give the appearance of being concerned about a social problem. Whether or not you really care about the outcome of policy or not, what I'm getting at here is that there's, there's sort of a play enacted here. Look at me, I'm concerned, I'm doing something about this issue that's very scary because it's caught on, it's a moral panic. And I'm doing something, and I can get some kind of political advantage from that. Um, the drug war is a fantastic example uh, of this, of all of these things, really. Um, it's a form of symbolic <coughs> politics. You're able to play on caricatures and stereotypes. The final thing I would sort of, sort of say to wrap this up, and to come back to symbolic politics a little bit, is that moral panics often occur in, time, in uncertain times where we're wrestling with something in society. There's some kind of uncertainty. So, um, 70s, 80s, we've got you know, the feminist movements from the 50s and 60s and earlier have, have had women demanding certain kinds of changes. We've got women entering the workforce in greater numbers. We've got queer folk also um, demanding their rights and recognition. We've got all these questions about the family. We've got an economy that's stagnating, where now if you're in a traditional two-parent home, both parents might need to work outside the home just to pay the bills. All of these changes are occurring. But what gets blamed for destroying the family among some constituencies? Feminists. <laughs> Queer folk. Certain folk devils. So moral panics tend to reflect some broader anxiety. Now we have things like internet addiction, video game addiction, and all kinds of scares related to youth. Now again, hear me really clearly. I'm not saying there's nothing to discuss around those things. We should have discussions about these changes. There are potential impacts. What I do suggest, though, is we really need to be wary about falling into some of these traps where we are actually in some ways fearing what I would say are the wrong things. My argument would be, if we're really concerned about the health, safety, and well-being of children and youth, we do things like fully fund schools, <laughs> pay teachers enough, make sure that we have counselors, enough counselors in schools that are able to deal with bullying and suicide prevention, uh, we do things like make them wear bike helmets. <laughs> Thankfully, there's been a turn towards that. We do all of these practical things. <clears throat> those things all require significant investment. And we do make some of those investments. But if you are a person in power that's reluctant to make some of those investments, or if we're a constituency that's reluctant to fund some of those investments, it's easier to blame television or music video games or what have you. Don't get mad at video games. Get mad at the fact that after school programs get cut, <laughs> that music programs are underfunded, that theater programs are sometimes so competitive in certain places that not everybody who wants to participate can participate. 
All of those kinds of things, I think, are better ways to focus our energy around what is troubling for our youth. But then we have to have complicated conversations. I'm going to stop there because we have, I think, then 20 minutes left for all of your questions. Thank you very, very much. I'll start with an easy one, Ross. Uh, I, I'm not, I, I don't dispute your argument. Uh, so then we get into the issue of moral relativism. Yeah. Is it binary? Is there such a thing? Is it absolutism versus relativism? Is there something in between? But. Uh, I'm sure you struggle with this all the time because you're you're living with this with these issues all the time, and this is more a philosophical than a sociological question. <laughs> but it seems to me that's what we're really left with is is the issue of of moral relativism, moral absolutism, something in between. Right, and I briefly mentioned this last time is that that I'm certainly not making an argument of moral relativism. What I'm laying out are what I see as a series of tools to not fall into the traps of moral absolutism and to be really careful about how we apply our moral judgments. Who's applying them to whom and what are the consequences? So there are, are there certain things and practices in the world that I find abhorrent and that even after I sort of step back, try to let go of some of my filters, question myself about my judgments, that I still say like, no, this is wrong, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And you're right, it is a philosophical question. Um, someone last time asked me about a specific example that comes up, like um, female circumcision, which opponents will call female genital mutilation. So there, right off the bat, you have different kinds of frames. And who am I, as a, a white Westerner in the U.S., to criticize a practice that's, that's practiced in other cultures, and so on and so forth. Like, that's ethnocentric of me. That's part of their tradition, so to speak. It's not, there's not an easy answer to that. So what, what I'm left with is, no, you know what? Patriarchy, male domination, exists in all cultures to a certain degree. To a lesser degree in some, to be sure. And that that has negative impact on women's and girls' lives. And that I'm willing to entertain that regardless of the culture. That's a broad social phenomenon. Um, so I, I can come to a place where I can say, you know what, I, this isn't right, and this is why it's not right. It does this kind of systematic harm to certain groups of people, and it's reinforced in these kinds of ways. That's a, that was not an easy one. <laughs> Gene Wubbles. Uh, so, uh, think about the appalling history of this. Uh, I wonder uh, why have uh, we been so stupid for so long about <laughs> these things as a society? And uh, I don't count myself, of course, among those that. Do. <laughs> <laughs> so I began to wonder, well, why? And you know who I think are the real frontline workers uh, here uh, that have and more probably to hold this down than anyone? English teachers. Say, say a little bit more so I'm really clear on what <laughs> well, Because those are the people in my memory who taught me to recognize when I wasn't thinking about something when I thought I was. Gotcha. I don't know if that's particular to English or could be from a variety of disciplines, but um, look, I, I'll try to keep this answer brief. Um, when you see some of these historical examples, it can be really easy to, to laugh or sigh or to express some horror at how we ended up in the crack baby scare, right? Um, and to have some disbelief. Why do we keep falling for this? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question. We have struggles. We have fears as human beings. We live in contexts that create feelings of alienation, despair, struggle. We experience inequality. And we have these existential fears and worries and desires and hopes and all these things. Like, it's very complicated. And so I don't think we should react with too much chagrin or shame that we keep falling for these things. 
Um, and we are all susceptible at different points. None of us, I would argue, is immune. What I'm hoping, though, is that through systematic study and reflection, that we can come to a place where we're not so easily duped. I think there are real concerns about young people and more broadly. I just think that sometimes we're manipulated, to be honest, um, <laughs> out of focusing on what are the, the, the more pertinent concerns. In the forest. Uh, for Sherman, <clears throat> in thinking about what, what moral panic uh, strikes me as, a, as an emotional issue. Mm -hmm. And I grew up thinking that I should be a person of reason, and reason would govern the world, and that's where we should, uh, where we should focus our, our growth, our efforts. But I've come to think that I was wrong, that really the emotional issue, we've got a balance between how we react emotionally and how we react reasonably. And, and in fact, I think the emotional is more fundamental than the reason. Yes. And, and, and looking at it that way, the balance between the two and how we, if we you know, reasonably think that scapegoating is wrong, but morally we accept it, I mean, uh, emotionally we accept it, right. how, how should we, you know, can you comment on that, on that, on that thought, on those thoughts? Right, and I, I don't want to totally juxtapose, you know, emotion and reason, and that can be a very gendered kind of thing too, like women are emotional, men are reason, and we value reason for good reason <laughs> in some ways, but we are emotional beings for good reason as well, right? Um, I think you're, in many ways you're right, and there's a whole sub-discipline in my field of sociology about the sociology of emotion. One of my Colleagues, in fact, Jules Bacon is doing a course at the college this semester on the sociology of emotion. And we are, there's sort of in the last 15, 20 years been a resurgence of interest around these questions. Um, and it's not that emotion is necessarily irrational, but these feelings are very strong. We are operating often out of emotion. And in fact, uh, not to be too cynical, but in some of my classes, when I teach about these issues of social problems, and the students are always asking, well, what do we do? Because they feel like they have the facts. And if they just tell people the facts and use reason, in other words, to show them that their point of view is wrong, that the problem's solved. And what we continually end up saying is, the facts will not save you. <laughs> us. Reason won't necessarily save us because people do operate out of emotion in some ways. But don't despair. <laughs> I think my solution, such as it is, and I could go on and on, is that if we recognize that people are emotional creatures, and we recognize that people grow up in contexts that shape their belief, sometimes we can anticipate their responses as we're trying to reason them. Again, the facts may not save us, but some patient persistence can. I'm not suggesting that everyone should be equipped to go and have an argument with a white supremacist. I would never ask that of everyone. However, there are some of us that may be equipped to reason with people that might have a certain belief system that we question, right? You know, it's, a, it's the same thing about guns and gun issues somebody asked me about. You know, and I, in some ways, I'm not sure that that debate is, totally falls into the category of a moral panic, but you could see where there's some similarities, right? You could easily caricature people on each side. You know, the anti-gun liberal that's an elitist and out of touch with real American values, and then the gun-toting absolutist who cares about firearms more than children's lives and, you know, some kind of evil caricature there, right? There's a lot of emotion packed up into guns and gun ownership for good reason. I think there's a way, actually, to have some conversation around that, accounting for people's emotion, but also using our reason. Yeah, I, think, I think that's a, a really important point that, um, you know, actually, neurologically, the parts of our brain that control action and decision-making are emotionally stimulated. So, um, I, I think there's a really important need for us to understand more about how we're making decisions. And the reason we fall into so many pits is one of the, the things that has been um, 
maybe uh, morally put down over the years is emotions themselves. Absolutely. If you're a man, you've gotten clear messages about what it's okay to feel and express and what it's not okay to feel and express. And women, they have other, almost the opposite messages. It's okay for them to feel the things that it's not okay for men right. to feel. There's just a mess yeah. around emotions and it's actually, emotionally it's how our brains decide what to do in life. So there's a real need for us to understand more about how we operate as people and to really get down at the cause of why we repress ourselves, our true selves, and then are more vulnerable to lives that, that attract our repressed emotions. Right, yeah, I, I agree, <laughs> I agree. Uh, Gail Strickler, it uh, seems to me that one of the things that uh, plays a part here is that for a lot of people, uh, the, the, the issues, with whatever they are, are binary. It's this way or that way, uh, that, that they're wanting an, an easy solution, so it's, it's not a matter of of wanting to look at what the issues are, it's mm -hmm. a, clearly a thing of, is it black or white? Sure. And I, I think that uh, Gene's point about influences we have growing up that lead to our development of critical thinking uh, does play a significant part in then how we respond to when these uh, moral panics occur and whether or not we readily join in or whether we stand back and uh, are able and willing to uh, see the, uh, the kinds of issues that you're raising. And I think one of the greatest that you've talked about is that whole issue of power is how I see things, but that whole thing of easy answers quick answers, uh, I think that plays a huge part for a lot of people in uh, responding to these, uh, these moral panics. Right. And the, the moral entrepreneurial campaign with that notion of an entrepreneur ties in with this issue of power, that these things don't necessarily just happen. Sometimes they're very intentional and they're meant to serve very specific means and there are people who are very good at capitalizing upon people's emotions and making issues more black and white than even they may be initially. Or someone gains from that. And I'm not just saying, just to kind of check ourselves here, I'm not just saying that someone on the wrong side of the issue from my perspective stands to gain. Activists that I might very much agree with have to be attuned to how emotion works. Okay? Like, also have to think about how do we mobilize emotion around a certain issue. What we're illustrating here is that, based on uh, the, the filters that we bring to a situation, how might we be manipulated, in some cases, by a moral entrepreneur or others, into believing certain things that, with a little more scrutiny, don't maybe line up even to what, what we might actually believe. Question up here. Marjorie Grade. Uh, I would ask what guidelines then would you suggest for parents in talking with their children to use in trying to persuade or guide them to useful ends? What what guidance would I give to parents? But I'm a parent, I need your guidance. <laughs> Those are your no, this is a great, great question, you know, because it brings us back to Earth and we think about what's the practical application of this. So I hinted a little bit about growing up in the 80s and having these awkward conversations with my mother about Dungeons and Dragons 
and heavy metal music, which is a very you know loud, abrasive kind of music that people were scared about. I think part of the point is we were having those conversations. And I know it's sort of a cliche, but talk, engage, ask questions without rushing to too much judgment, right? So as a parent, what do I plan on doing? I plan on trying as best I can to be attuned to what my kids are consuming, what they're getting into, and, and so on. But I think as I do that, because I'm equipped with this kind of knowledge, with this framework, when I hear something that's going around, I'm able to question before jumping to conclusions. So recently, and I'm going to mess this up, you might have to help me, um, what's it called? Momo. Momo? Oh, yeah. There was this scare going around, and our daughter's principal even, even sent something out about it where kids would watch this something online, right? And that uh, it was encouraging suicide. And so parents were getting worked up about this, and it apparently was making the rounds enough that our principal felt like he had to address it. And, but when we got the email, we read it, and we thought, we're not sure if he's, his parents are reading this, we're not sure how they're reading it. We were actually worried that the message was, you should be worried about this. Whereas we know it was a hoax. <laughs> With like two minutes of Google searching, you know, we figured out very quickly like, oh no, this isn't a thing. <laughs> this isn't real. And so we wrote the principal and said, you know, just, and we were very careful not to try to say, what are you doing? <laughs> but you might want to be aware that other parents might be reading this as a real thing, and they might be going to talk to their kids about this thing, and you might actually create a problem where there isn't one. <laughs> so we're very skeptical when it comes to these broad claims. And finally, what I'll say is, in terms of parenting and kids and their well-being, we can't let ourselves get distracted by these other things. So if we're reducing youth violence to rap music, and not really doing the policy work around bullying, around social inequality, around gun violence, as a society, we're completely missing the boat, in my estimation. Like that, but that's where we've been at different points. Let's have a congressional hearing on the detrimental effects of rap music. Again, hear me. Is there rap music I would never let my child listen to, or heavy metal music, or absolutely. Both genres, one dominated by musicians of color, one dominated by white musicians, can be very misogynist. Disgusting stuff. I'll monitor that. But there's no way I'm falling for the line that like the cause of youth violence is these black rappers that are glorifying violence. That's way too simple of an explanation. We have just, what, a minute left? I don't know if we have time for one more. A quick one. Quick one. <laughs> and last one. Just a quick comment, John, please. The idea of the youth being corrupted is as old as society. If we believe history, yeah. <laughs> Socrates was put to death for corrupting the youth. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> These concerns aren't so new. I would, I would say that they've maybe been amplified, because remember last time I talked about sort of the social creation of youth? We've always had people who were aged three years old, four, five, twelve, whatever. But how we treat and think about those people are a little bit differently. And in the 20th century, we really started thinking about this whole category of young people. And that brought on this whole wave of new concerns. Russ, thank you so right. much. For thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Remember about the chairs, if you will.